What did uh, going through the divorce teach you about what you were looking for in a partner? Um, well, I think yeah, I think going through such a you know horrible time. I know you know many people unfortunately goes through it, but I think number one is first it was like you look at yourself and you go, what's wrong with me? Uh, especially because at this time I was number one in the world. I played at the Colonia. I had a book to come out. I mean, it was a lot of positive things, but right. just on my personal side, it was just, it was turmoil and it was just very complicated. And then once you get over the blaming thing, it's like, okay, well, you know, I can, I'm sure I can improve. I think the best advice I got from somebody is, you know, it's like, you know, you go into a dance with somebody, um, and if that person doesn't want to dance, it's going to be very difficult. And I realized that uh, I didn't have anybody to dance with, and this was my life. You know, if you're going to uh, live with somebody, they, they need to be part of it. I felt like being on the golf course, I was in control on the golf course. Like, I was in control of what club to hit, where to hit it. My golf ball listened, but my partner didn't listen. So it was like, I'm in control here. That's probably why I played well, is I was excited to be on the golf course because uh, it was going my way. and. Um, so I was able to shut that part off. As a matter of fact, I wanted to be more on the golf course because I was, I, was, I was in a happy place there. I was talking to uh, Mike the other day and he said uh, he knew right away that you were the one. How about for you? Uh, one of the things that always stood out was his smile. You know, he has a very affectionate smile and you know, he was always a very happy guy and uh, seemed to be enjoying life. Um, and then when he started to work with tournaments, I would run into him. He was always so sweet and always so nice and humble and I would congratulate her, all oh, thanks, how are you? You know, always deflecting praise. And then, you know, my life kind of got turned around and, you know, I was going through a divorce and, and my friend said, you got to go meet somebody and, well, it's easy to say, you're number one in the world and, and you know, where do you meet people? And, right. But anyway, I was literally just cleaning my office and uh, his business card was right there. And I remember looking at it and, and I think I smiled because I know he would have smiled. So yeah, that was kind of, that was cool. So you, <laughs> it uh, gets to you now, what about it? You know, he understands me and he takes my faults and then he, he makes me feel good and I can be a little, you know, I'm quite strict, I'm quite disciplined, I'm quite focused, and that could be annoying for some people, and maybe some good sides too. But, you know, it's, you know, you jump in with somebody who's just kind of on a mission, and, you know, he jumped in there from the beginning. I felt that I understood her lifestyle, you know, my dad having played the tour for 16 years. My mom was the best wife, and everything was about him, and taking care of his game, and whatever he needed. I have kind of felt I had that in me. Um, to understand and support her and give her what she needed. And you kind of picked him up too, right? <laughs> I sending did, the first yeah. email. You know, the business card showed up. I reached out, you know, I sent him an email and I guess I ended up in, in his spam box. I had time to actually look through my spam and I like would delete the whole page. And But then I saw one that said, hey Mike, hope you're well. Um, if this is still your email address, you know, I'd love to say hi or something like that. All the best, Sonica Sorenstam. And I was like, I thought it was a buddy busting my chops, like why would she email me? You throw out your fishing rod and if you get a bite, great. If you don't get a bite, you get another hook. <laughs> so, uh, and he bit. It just so happens you're with your colleague who then gets a call right. from her. She was hitting balls here at Lake Nona, driving it badly, which doesn't often happen, slammed her driver on the ground, which doesn't happen, and the little Callaway Chevron V broke off, which doesn't happen. And she called Barry to see if that was gonna affect the swing weight. He handed me the phone, I asked her to dinner. You know, it was a, a, a slow process. And I really didn't know at the time what, you know, my mental status. I wasn't lonely or anything, but you know, it's fun to have company and so forth. So we just literally just started to chat. She was going through a rough time and then I was patient and, and you know, didn't make any moves or anything. I was just the nice, like the neighbor, you know. Mike says uh, you probably thought something was wrong with him because of how long it took him to kiss you for the first oh, time. Oh, I, I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, I looked at him and I respected his, uh, you know, just taking the time and, and real. And I, I think I realized at that time, you know, he's, this is for the long term. How did he propose? I was having just the most quiet day in the office, literally sitting in my PJs or my robe and just not having anything on the agenda. The day I proposed, um, I was going to do it. We were going to go to Monaco after the Solheim Cup. Oh, I just thought, James Bond at the casino, you know, I'll wear my suit and it'll be great And the dress she talked about. And that day she said literally three or four times, oh, 
I love this. I love being home. I love having nothing to do. This is so great, so relaxing. And I was like, what's better than that, you know, so. He went down and he, he did it the proper way or the real way or whatever you want to say, the traditional way. And there was a split second decision I went on in, your end. I went right in the bedroom and I got in my sock drawer and I got the ring and I stuck it in my pocket and I was like in my shorts and t-shirt, you know, to work out and just thought this is so not romantic. <laughs> and, uh, but I did it and thankfully she said yes. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, I was like, now here, you know, you always think it's gonna be fancy and, and a dress and a beautiful dinner and music and champagne and, uh, but no, it was just, it was just us. So my mom told me the best advice ever, that every relationship has a king and every relationship has a queen. Sometimes the king's the queen, sometimes the queen's the king. And, you know, it made immediate sense that she is the king in our relationship. I, I totally get that. I embrace that. I respect that. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. People bust my chops, call me Mr. Sorenstam. And I laugh and I'm like, it's Mr. Annika. You know, we don't use Sorenstam. We try to do the Annika brand. So call me Mr. Annika. You know, I'm, I'm proud of it and I love it. You share uh, an office together here at the house. What's that working dynamic like? You know, it's very good, I'll say. We, we get along well, we respect each other, and we think a lot alike. It's not like we're sitting there, you know, eight hours together. Um, we take turns taking both kids to school, and then we come out, usually I'll go straight to the office, she'll work out or do something or go practice. Although what happens when she goes out putting? <laughs> she needs a break. I you were surprised that. to learn this. Yeah, yeah, it was a, she did a podcast, and she said, yeah, I feel like if I just need a break, I'll just go practice, and I was like, Oh, <laughs> that's why you're practicing all the time. 